in modern day society they were sufferers. Na Mokai can also be translated as slaves, and that social class is familiar to Rasta. And here's a contemporary context. A little while back, Labour's Shane Jones chided the Tuahini Tariana Turia for referring to the gang members as our people. They are not our people, Shane Jones said. Why? They are not even people. They are slaves. Nothing much changes. In any case, these country kids would arrive in a city like Wellington, penniless and often friendless. The cousin they were looking to stay with might well have moved. In the early 1970s, there were regularly 50 or so staying at the Wellington Railway Station. Fired by the Don't Moan About It Act message of the radical American community organiser Saul Alinsky, a team of us decided that as we were dealing with homelessness, we would confront the authorities in the very house of the people, Parliament itself. I'd noted that if you wore a hat into the parliamentary foyer, the old security guards would flock around you to make you remove it. This was also true if you smoked. Thinking in cause and effect terms, I sent a hat-wearing smoking squad in. <laughs> Whilst the guards were distracted, another 50 or so of us carried in mattresses <laughs> and bedded down. <laughs> we got everyone nice and comfy. The, uh, there was consternation. Policemen and journalists flocked like buzzards in at the kill. Uh, but a wise old martyr, the wonderful late Machu Rata, then Minister of Māori Affairs, intervened and kōrero ensued. In direct action, you've got to know when to hold them and when to fold them, and a solution was found. And so the tribe of Ngā Mōkai went home to a new house, tired but happy. I personally didn't quite appreciate it at the time, but we were following a line of reasoning established by the first Māori to speak in the New Zealand Parliament, Tāriha Te Mananui. Focus on the good, he said. Stand up to evil and come together to deal to it, but focus on the good. Tariha's home base is Waiohiki, which is where I live with my family and children. 33 years ago, I organised one of the early hui of the black power there. This was the beginning of the move towards what Ta Mason Jury now calls acculturation and the addressing of the tribelessness of Ngā Mōkai. Walker's prescient comments also deserve reflection and assessment of the efficacy of the international policies of suppression and exclusion of sufferers and provide a stark contrast to the scenes in Great Britain today where the failure to constructively engage with the youth has led to the unhappy and destructive behaviour we currently witness. It's a matter of interest, if not of significance, that in reclaiming their cultural identity, the sufferers of the day pivoted around two key pa, both called Hiruhama. One with James K. Baxter's commune up the Wanganui River, and the other on the east coast at Ruatoria. Around 1873 or so, the first stanzas, stanzas of the lyrics of reggae music were entering the lexicon of my consciousness. Gordon Campbell, then writing for the listener, had convinced me to read Babylon on Tin Wire. I'd seen a movie called The Harder They Come, featuring Jimmy Cliff, and listened to an album called Burning by an artist named Bob Marley. But an African tribesman, smelling of mud and ochre, took charge of my mind and hoisted me like a sack on his shoulder to teach me what I never knew. Well, brother, today I walk the town as a new stranger and my heart is beating 
like an old buffalo drum. In 1979, along with Brother Tiggy and Miriama, I too uh, met the uh, uh, Mangai uh, Wopata. And like many others before and since, the philosophy for action became clear. Burn down Babylon metaphorically with a message of love. Stand up for your rights. Be active but not destructive. Be creative with passive resistance. Now, I'm just going to change chat track a little bit and um, use some other technology. Um, and we'll just get into a bit of discourse of the time. Um, so in this first clip, you'll see the aftermath of a little riot in the green-leafed Wellington suburbs of Wilton. Here, emboldened by their recent graduation and new uniforms, a vanload of cops clubbed a Maori guy down <coughs> on his own doorstep because the reggae was too loud. This raised the ire of the people to the degree that the police were beaten back time and time again until good sense prevailed on all sides. Go baby! Sparked in the early hours of today after authorities were chased off while investigating complaints of a noisy party. Oh, That's alright. What happened there? Riot shields and were driven back by a hail of bricks and Molotov cocktails. <laughs> Police marksmen were called at three o'clock and circled the house. But it was not until daybreak and the arrival of a gang conciliator that the seven-hour siege was broken. Next one. Reggae provided the natural background to the social life of the suburbs. This is, uh, this is at the Headhunters, uh, Chaos were playing, uh, but for, uh, and Alma and Chaos were the uh, band du jour uh, for any decent uh, convention, a gang convention or gang party in the day, but for them uh, it wasn't necessarily uh, all right. But we know that eventually they will get the same pressure. I tell you what, you know, we all know this all right, we're shit on night, you know? That's what it is. A finger from a band called Ra's Messengers talking in Potirua in 1979. from the social enjoyment of reggae music to the beginning of consciousness. 
He started talking about Rasta when the, uh, after the first time he had been into prison. That was after he'd been into Mount Eden. I think that's when he first came home and started like, really talking about Rasta. The identity of as Rasta became an acceptable way for a member of the Mongol mob or of the Black Power to withdraw from their respective and oppositional groups into a new, neutral and communal brother and sisterhood. The message of conscious righteousness took on a new fire with the imprisonment of Brother Tiggy for his courageous actions during the 1981 Springboks tour and his apostolic work in carrying the message to his fellow inmates in Mount Eden. And one of these was a young Mongol mob member from the East Coast called Chris Campbell, the brother Cutter. Rumatoria is an isolated community an hour and a half north of Gisborne by road. It's a home for about 800 people. It's a rural community of about 4,500. 90% of the population is Maori. Trouble began in 1984 with the formation of a Rastafarian group by members of the town's Black Power Gang. Rastafarians worship Ethiopia's late president, Haile Selassie. In the last 18 months, there have been 30 cases of arson, which have hit houses, hay barns, cars, and local business establishments. The fire station and the courthouse and police station have been burnt down. In whatever way the new movement, regardless of adherence to and celebration of tikanga, the whakapapa of the members and the adherence to biblical values, it would still be... Over a decade ago, Ruatoria was infamous for a series of arsons and its Rastafarians. The media described the Rastas as a cult practicing a foreign religion, but the reality was that their beliefs were based on knowledge, prophecy and an understanding of the Bible. It is through the Bible that they create find their salvation. So we've got outlaws. Next one, Rob. We've got gang. We've got people able to. Oh, because some of their own children yep. growing up as hunted outlaws. We're gonna chase those crazy ballers out of town. They call themselves Rastafarians, a movement popularized by reggae music. They threatened to burn down the town and the. So the next thing that happened straight after that. Click on is exactly what's happening in London. 1985, a police party surrounded a remote shack on a farm in the early hours of the morning. Chris Campbell and others were inside, but despite having them covered, they not only managed to escape, but Campbell kidnapped a police officer by taking his gun off him and making off into the bush. Stung into action, the police turned the Ruatoria area into something akin to a set for a film about Vietnam. More than 70 armed police descended on the town. Using two Air Force helicopters, they crisscrossed the area, searching in vain for Campbell and his... So, in his gang, is what Derek was going to say. And then you see, result of that, vigilante. We didn't start challenging the system, we started challenging our own families, and our own parents. Because, you know, they got the police in. Our, our parents got the police in. You sort of discipline us in to use as a raw of Next one. See, it cuts us off pretty fast, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Vigilantes. Oh, if we form their own law, would we? Yeah, well, you know, you know, you'd only see that in the movies. Yeah. You would only see that in the movies. So, you know, they had that whole vigilante movement. You see the right wing in London at the moment lining up in exactly the same way. And this last clip. Ah, oh, yeah. So, I was going to give you a bit about the blacks there, but it, this, this sort of cycle's come around again, back to now we've got the organised criminal gang selling methamphetamine, and, and, you know, and so we've just gone back into this re-encapsulation of the whole sufferer thing. 